Thanks, Doug. Good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Uh, it really is my pleasure to welcome everyone to this inaugural series, um, webinar series, um, specifically focusing on sharing best practices. Um, just to sort of kick us off with a little bit of background information, opportunities to share and seek best practices in many different areas of infant, child and youth health service delivery continues to be a primary focus and undertaking of many, uh, many CAFC related activities. We really are pleased to serve, to serve you as our partners, as our members, as our colleagues, to serve as a communicator um, as a knowledge broker by facilitating many different venues and opportunities for us together to share best practices across our child and youth health care community. Um, over the past several months, um, a group of senior financial leaders, health administrators, clinicians from across our community, from across the country, have created an informal network with a mandate and vision to share best business and financial practices. Today marks our inaugural event um, to expand this opportunity for sharing best practices across the CAFC network through what we hope will become quarterly webinars being organized to share and discuss various business as well as financial practices related to many different patient care topics and experiences. This series will be led, we hope, by many of you who are both financial and patient care leaders from across the country, who we hope will come together and share your experiences, ideas, lessons learned, as well as new and innovative practices aimed always at efficiently and effectively managing our, what we know are limited resources. At this point, it's absolutely an honor for me to hand over to a colleague and uh, leader within, within our child and youth health uh, community in, in, in Canada, of course, and that is Alan Horsbrew. Alan is the Senior Vice, Pre uh, Vice President Finance at the IWK Health Center in Halifax, and Alan has also been serving as the Chair of CAFC Senior Financial Leaders Network. Alan, my pleasure to turn over to you to provide us with a, just an overview of, of today's webinar and, and perhaps a brief glimpse at, um, at, at uh, really your initial vision and, uh, and goals going forward. Thank you very much, Elaine, and uh, really appreciate uh, yourself, Doug, and others at CAFC helping us uh, with this webinar and this initiative. I think really, it's kind of as you indicated, we're seeing across Canada and really internationally the pressure to control healthcare expenditures and make the system more sustainable going into the future is a daunting task facing us all. And whenever we go to conferences and read articles and so on, we know there's lots of great work being done out there by all sorts of different teams in each of our organizations. So how can we best leverage that was the impetus which kind of gave birth to this idea of uh, a business network originally started and then we looked at really trying to expand it so that we could present material and information on best practices that all sorts of uh, stakeholders could listen to and observe and ask questions around. So we hope that we can present it in the context so that the patient care folks can see what's happening and then ask some great questions as well as the business colleagues also. So that's really all it's about is trying to establish best practices across the country, learn from one another and, uh, you know, work as a team. And certainly CAFC is, that's what CAFC has always been about, working collectively as a team for our patient population. So we just thought this was a great opportunity. So we thought a great inaugural uh, webinar kickoff would be none other than our friends and colleagues at Alberta Health Services. Uh, with their restructuring, uh, I think the rest of the country has certainly been watching eagerly with uh, what they've been doing and how successful they are and where they're heading. So we thought that would be the, the perfect uh, topic to uh, do our inaugural webinar. And today joining us from Alberta Health Services, we have Deborah Rhodes, who's the Senior Vice President of Finance, and Abby Birch, who is the Director of Business Advisory for Operations as well. 
So they will walk you through their slide deck. And uh, as Doug indicated, you guys can all table questions in the panel box, and they will try to answer them at uh, points throughout. But I'll hand it over to them to uh, let them explain how they'll walk through their presentation. So off to you guys. Good morning, everybody. It's Abby. So I'm just going to walk through a few slides on just an introduction to Alberta Health Services and a few quick facts about us. So just a little bit about our history. So Alberta Health Services was announced by the government uh, the middle of May 2008, and that was to bring together uh, 13 former entities, including health regions and also a, a few provincial entities. And then we became a legal entity um, April 1, 2009. Uh, Alberta, or the health services moved from municipalities to Alberta Health Services at the same time. And also our EMS services were added at that same time, April 1st, 2009. So a few quick facts about us. We have 90,000 employees with about 7,200 physicians, serving a population of 3.7 million Albertans. We have 97 acute care hospitals, five psychiatric facilities, uh, 9,000 acute care, subacute care beds, and 19,000 long-term care and supportive living beds, as well as 1,500 addiction and mental health beds and five urgent care centers within the province. So part of the work when we came to be an entity was to come up with what were our values going to be, and we came up with four main values that drive our decision making, and that is respect, accountability, transparency, and engagement. Our mission is to provide a patient-focused quality health system that's accessible and sustainable for all Albertans. And the goals that we strive to achieve are quality, which means healthcare services that are safe, effective, and patient-focused. Access with appropriate healthcare services available no matter where you live in Alberta and sustainability for our organization so that our health services are available, are delivered within available resources now and also in the future. So to do this, our vision is to be the best performing publicly funded healthcare system in Canada. And to achieve that, we look to provide patient-focused quality health system that's accessible and sustainable for all Albertans. And the measure that we, that we use is to achieve the targets outlined in our health plan, um, as this is key in recognizing the system indicators that will enable Alberta Health Services to demonstrate to Albertans that we have become the best performing publicly health funded system in Canada. So to, our, to achieve our vision, we again use this wheel that looks at quality, access, and sustainability. And the purpose is to demonstrate that we have alignment between our health plan, our key performance targets and priorities, and for this coming fiscal year, both our budget and business plans. So to do this, we were able to work with government to get a five-year funding commitment, which um, has helped us because health, ha health spending has continued to increase in what our former health entities were. So over the next few years, we would be getting a 6% increase for the first three years and 4.5% increase for each of the remaining two years. And this has really helped us being able to plan ahead rather than wait for our funding to come in, in at the beginning of the year and then figure out afterwards how we're going to, how where the spending is going to go. And an example of that would be this year we were able to have um, a plan in place and waiting for approval so that come April or May we can put that plan in action rather than waiting till the summer to try and put it in action. Uh, Include in that our savings and cost avoidance that we were able to achieve in both 2009-10 and this, this past fiscal year, 10-11, to help us with our future sustainability. 
Um, Alberta Health Services is expanding services within its funding envelope, and we must maintain tight controls over our spending and invest in strategies to ensure sustainability in the future. So our health plan going forward outlines how we will fulfill our requirements to assess ongoing health needs, prioritize and allocate resources for the provision of health services, ensure reasonable access to quality health services for everybody in the province, promote and protect the health of the population, and work towards prevention, promote the provision of health services that are responsive to the needs of individuals and communities, and support the integration of services and facilities. So this builds on our 2010 health plan and Alberta's five-year health action plan and outlines key opportunities and strategies to improve the health of Albertans and the health systems in Alberta. So our five-year strategic timeline, year one and two is looking at creating capacity within our system and building on lean to improve and, and also to work on the culture of change within the organization. Year three, was to, is to create capacity and incentives for reinvestment and reassessment. So even though we have a five-year funding commitment, the only way to uh, make sure that our system is sustainable is to um, achieve some savings to increase the funding envelope that we can reinvest within our organization. So year three would also begin clinical leadership engagement for transformation and link to development of networks. Year four, we want to generate significant savings for reinvestment and reinvest in access-driven pathways. And then the fifth year of our plan is to seek reinvestment in program level shift to significant upstream prevention and new primary care population-based partnership. And we're sitting somewhere in year two, three um, currently. <laughs> so then... For this coming fiscal year, 11-12, we have priority areas that we're focusing on for investment, which includes 10 key measures. These are driven by our commitment to become the best performing publicly funded health system in Canada, which is in part measured by 50 Tier 1 measures. We strive to seek a balance between access, quality, and sustainability, and our priorities include focus on population health and workforce. And some of these Tier 1 measures require relatively more focus as we are currently a significant distance from the target and or our national benchmark. <coughs> Great. Um, it's uh, Deb Rhodes, and I'm just going to take over for the next little bit. So just in terms of the uh, priority areas and focusing, um, one of the issues I think that we've been facing is that, um, as you said, we have de developed around 50 Tier 1 measures. And we are finding that our focus is quite diverse and that one of the things that we have identified as a leadership uh, team within Alberta Health Services is that we do need to do a little bit more focused work over the next bit. We're trying to do a lot and trying to move a lot of markers. So we actually have chosen 10 key measures for uh, next year that we're going to work on. And they are some of the very, very big ones. And they are some ones where Alberta is currently quite a significant um, distance from both our targets that have been set and agreed to with Alberta Health and Wellness, as well as some national benchmarks. <clears throat> so some of those measures are the percentage of patients treated and discharged from emergency departments, as well as wait times for various um, surgeries. Primarily the ones we're focusing on this year are cardiac surgery, hip replacement, knee replacement, cataract, and cancer surgery. And then, of course, one of the other big markers that I know that everyone in the country is struggling with is the number of patients waiting in acute care hospital beds for continuing care placement and the number of people waiting in community um, for continuing care placement. So as you can see on this slide 13, one of the other things that we've been challenged by our board to do is to more clearly articulate and be able to um, enunciate for them that we're actually putting our money where our mouth is. So can we demonstrate the alignment of the resource allocation with these measures and with what we're trying to accomplish. And to be honest, we, we still have a long ways to go at that. This is the first year that we've tried to um, organize the budget around that and, and trying to show those 
trying to show those linkages. And to be honest, we know that we could still be doing a much better job um, at that. But um, we at least have started that process. <coughs> Outside of those key priority measures, we also identified a number of additional priorities. So the first being South Health Campus. And that is the building of a new acute care center in South uh, Calgary, um, which will be about 350 acute care beds and brings together a number of services. And what we're really trying to do at the South Health Campus is to open it um, right from the beginning with different staffing models, uh, uh, you know, different ways of working, much more electronic. And so that's sort of been the focus around the South Health Campus project. Um, we're, st we're hoping to have some initial people um, in in late 2012. And we are also planning on starting it with some virtual units operating in some vacant space at some of our other facilities to try and bring those teams together and get them working together so that when they transition over into the new facility, they already um, are a team. <clears throat> also trying to do some work on obesity, diabetes, and chronic disease management with the development of five-year plans, um, linking both uh, investment opportunities as well as savings opportunities and uh, <clears throat> the various different initiatives that we want to move forward with in those areas. Uh, workforce planning and process improvement, um, starting a real focus on lean um, as the uh, tool of, sort of tool of choice, um, as well as what we're calling the Alberta Improvement Way. So just very early on in that process, we've got a couple of areas that have done a fair amount of work, um, one being the emergency rooms from a clinical perspective and from a, a support services perspective, the other areas that have done a fair amount of work to date are the lab as well as uh, facilities management that a fair amount of work with lean. So going to be a lot more focused on that over the next couple of years. <clears throat> Children's mental health and the development of a comprehensive addiction and mental health strategy are definitely big priorities for us over the coming year, as well as strengthening um, and standardizing our home care services across the province as well as primary care and then capital investments in initiatives to enhance necessary infrastructure. So we have um, identified what we've done is determine five different tips. So we have um, tried to prioritize um, under five different tips. Um, the fifth tip being uh, enabling one health system and that's been the focus around our system consolidation. Tip four has been focus around our health uh, workforce. Tip three is focused around um, <clears throat> seniors, um, tip two around access and uh, surgery wait times, and then tip one around primary health. So those are sort of our areas of focus um, over the next five years. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea, um, we did allocate a little over $600 million of new budgets for 2011-2012 um, to start to address some of these key priorities and wait times, and you can see um, the split of those. Significant investment, as you can see, in a continuing care capacity. One of the key things that we are trying to do is ensure that we've got our seniors more choice for seniors um, and ensuring that we've got appropriate placements for, for them so that they can age in place across the continuum, which we know is, is more cost efficient and cost effective, but is also a greater quality of care um, for those for those individuals as well. So it's, it's one of the ones that is definitely a real win-win um, for all parts of the system. <clears throat> this next slide just talks a little bit about how we're trying to understand our key cost drivers and um, trying to ensure that we are sort of looking at all different aspects as we're developing our strategies. So of course we know that in terms of uh, key drivers, Population growth is a significant driver, general price inflation, health-related inflation, and utilization, and the aging population. So we're just trying to ensure that we are very cognizant of that and that we are tying um, all of those back as we're, as we're managing our business. So in terms of managing the cost curve, <coughs> we know that costs increase as a result of both changes in service volumes and inflationary. Um, pressures. And in terms of changes in service volumes, we know that that's both growth in service volumes, but as well as changes in technology. Um, you know, some of the changes in technology are great for patient care and great for quality of life, but come with quite an expensive uh, price tag associated with them in lots of cases. So 
that whole technology and, and management of new technology is, is a significant um, cost driver as well. <clears throat> so the former health entities had uh, rates of increase um, averaging of over 10 percent. And so we do know that with this agreement, this funding commitment that we have with the, with the government, we need to bend that cost curve to 6 percent and then in the last two years of the agreement, which are creeping up on us quite quickly, down to 4.5 percent. So we need to do this through a combination of changing the way we deliver the services, changing the amount of service that we deliver, making sure it's the most appropriate service done by the most appropriate staff, <coughs> and um, ensuring that we are doing um, efficiency and effectiveness improvement on a go-forward basis. So some of, the, some of the things that we have done to manage the cost curve, um, we've worked quite diligently at procurement savings, and we are at, at attempting to save over $200 million, um, over a three-year period. So that's been done through a combination of, of things. And we're still very early on in that. To date, probably most of the savings have come from contract negotiations and looking at the contracts that were in place over the uh, 9 versus 12, sometimes based on different contracts, as many as 9 or 12 different contracts for things, trying to standardize, move as much as possible to the lowest cost um, of those, signed on with HealthPro, and we've seen significant savings from that as well. Um, really working hard at determining and delivering the right care in the right place, and as I said, a big focus, we are going to open about 5,000 new long-term care, continuing care spaces over a five-year period. We opened about 1,100 last year. We're aiming to open between 1,100 and 1,300 in this current fiscal year, and then a minimum of 1,000 each in the next three years. So hoping to see some significant uh, reduction in pressure on our acute care facilities, as well as, I said, um, delivering more appropriate care for those seniors and at uh, lesser cost. Um, act, uh, activity-based funding, so we are, uh, and actually we're changing the term to now acuity-based funding, so we are experimenting with that in a couple of different areas. We have implemented it quite significantly in long-term care to date. Um, our plan has been a six-year implementation for our contracted service providers and a two-year implementation phase for our owned and operated facilities. So last year was the first year of that implementation, and so what we did was we gave everybody a small base lift, and then we uh, allocated the additional 2% to those facilities that were furthest away um, in terms of lower cost than others and brought them up. And so we're managing that, you know, as I said, that phase in around where we will start to reduce funding to those areas that are overfunded um, over a six-year period if they are a contracted service and over a two-year period if they are an internally owned system. Uh, and then I talked a little bit about process improvements and lean. <coughs> so it, our goal is to um, bend that cost curve while meeting demand and continuing to improve the quality of the health services um, that we provide. <coughs> so this next slide just talks a little bit about um, one of the things that our board asked us was can we articulate to them what we have saved so far um, from the beginning of Alberta Health Services. And we believe that in terms of hard dollar savings as well as avoided cost increases, we're somewhere in the range of about $600 million. Um, and that includes, uh, as I said, hard savings, but as well also includes a lot of avoided cost increases, primarily identified um, with bringing uh, benefit plans together, bringing uh, staff uh, uh, collective agreements together, um, those types of uh, types of savings. In terms of our current spend by area, I, I think we're, we're quite similar to what you would see um, in terms of other organizations. So uh, I think, you know, inpatient acute nursing, around 26 percent. I think that varies anywhere in most systems from 26 to 35 percent. Um, diagnostic and therapeutic, 17 percent emerge and outpatient patient services 11. So a, a fairly, uh, I would say, consistent spend by area from what you would see in, in most systems. Uh, probably one of the areas, I'll just go back, probably one of the areas that we maybe do invest a little bit more in than what some other systems do and, and an area where we know we, need, we know we need to continue to invest more is in technology. We spend, from the operating budget, we spend about 3% on IT 
and we spend about another 3% if you were to take our capital spend into account. So we're currently spending about 6 to 7% on IT. <clears throat> In terms of uh, key organizational risks and assumptions um, that we need to watch for to ensure that we don't get um, off track in terms of our goals and objectives. The first is our savings initiative. W one of the things we are finding, as all of you do know, is that it is much uh, more difficult work to gather and garner savings than it is to make investments. And so one of the things that we've really tried to be diligent about is that we are not going to flow our investments until we see evidence of the savings. So we are funding a significant portion of our new investments through savings. So we will be ensuring that we are demonstrating those efficiencies and those savings prior to making some of the other um, investments. Staffing and resource constraints. We are anticipating needing to hire a significant amount of new staff. And th that, I think, will be a challenge, both in terms of our ability to do it in a timely manner, as well as to gather and garner those resources in some of those key areas, such as, well, pediatrics. NICU nurses, um, you know, is a, is a good is a very good example. Critical care, emerge, um, all of those areas. So, uh, definitely working hard on our on our workforce planning, and definitely still a lot of work to do there. Timing of implementation. One of the things that I think I would say that I've seen, and just to give you a little bit of a quick history, I'm I'm very new to Alberta Health Services. I've been here about ten months now. I came from the Saskatoon Health Region where I was the Vice President of Finance and Administration um, for about 10 years. And one of the things that I think that I would say that I've seen uh, since my coming to Alberta Health Services is that with the number of things that we are trying to move and the number of agendas that we're trying to move at the, at the current time, we are struggling with implementation and being able to implement on a timely basis. And therefore, we are seeing some delayed implementation um, both on the saving side, but as well as on the investment side. So sometimes um, we're anticipating that we'll get an um, initiative up and running and start to see progress from it in, say, six months or 12 months. And it's probably taking us more like nine to 18 months to see that progress, So, which I think is a lot uh, a result of the fact that we have so much on the go. Unanticipated issues and pressures, as you all know, um, we get lots of uh, you know, issues coming forward that are not necessarily priorities that we had planned to address in the current year. And so we're constantly having to reshuffle and to relook and to reallocate um, both resources, but as well as time as well. And time is a, is a limited resource as well. The political environment, um, for those of you that may have been watching, um, quite unsettled here in Alberta at the current time. The current premier has announced that um, he will be stepping down. Um, in September, as has the leader of the opposition party, also announced that he will be stepping down. So um, things are um, quite interesting uh, here. So we are anticipating uh, that there will be an election here um, in the next number of months. As well, um, we are currently operating with an, an acting CEO, uh, Dr. Chris Eagle. Um, so we also have that. Um, sort of in place at the current time. So I, I would think that we would all describe that it's quite um, volatile here at the, at the current time. But you know, we just continue to um, work as best we can within that and um, move forward with our organizational direction. And then as well, we are in the midst of trying to consolidate um, a number of different union agreements. I think somewhere between 80 and 100. Um, agreements into four agreements, so significant amount of work occurring um, at that point as well. <clears throat> From a procurement perspective, um, our, the last uh, data I was able to get from uh, CPSM is that we are um, have saved about $67.8 million um, in, uh, from September 24th of 2010 to um, March of 2011. So some of it has come from uh, provincial price harmonization, new contract awards, um, GPO, uh, as I said, with Health Pro. <coughs> so in terms of total savings achieved, um, 
you know, we are anticipating that over over a five-year period that that will be um, savings and cost avoidance of about $680 million. So just want to go in a little bit. I, I know there's been lots of interest in sort of how successful Alberta Health Services has been in its savings. And um, to be honest, we still have a long ways to go. We're starting to tackle some things. But I'd like to, I'm going to give you a little bit of sort of the history or a comparative history context because one of the other things is that, that you will see from these slides is that Alberta also has a lot of potential um, to save because of where we're starting from. So um, the following slides will demonstrate Alberta um, has the highest health care expenditures in Canada, a very, very high investment in hospitals, an underinvestment in seniors, high use of acute care beds. Um, I'm not sure we've got much for slides that demonstrate this, but we do know from our data that we have interprovincial inequities and a low life expectancy compared to other project, pro provinces. So, um, you know, Alberta on a per capita basis is, I believe, um, still the highest or very close to the highest um, province uh, overall. So we do have some room to, to, to move. We also um, have a high investment in hospitals. So we, we do have a lot of hospital beds that we are running and we are trying to look to see whether or not we can start to move some of that. Um, we have a historical underinvestment in seniors, hence our strategy of adding those 5,000 additional beds um, over a five-year period. I think our goal will be, if we can, to add even more. But our commitment um, that, we're, that we're striving for to the provincial government is a minimum of 5,000 over five years. <clears throat> so as you can see, um, you know, high use of acute care beds, acute care bed days um, for adjusted capita. So, um, and we are continuing to add additional beds, though we are trying to only add about 4% uh, increase in, in acute care beds. And as you can see, um, significantly more beds in both continuing care palliative and um, community beds, mental health and other community supports. So, Doug, I thought that this would be a good place where um, I'm going to transition back to Abby, and I thought if there were any questions that we could answer, this would be a good time as well. Yeah, we have had a couple questions. Uh, the first one was just simply, will this presentation or slides be available for download later? And we will be, re we are recording this presentation, and we'll be posting it on our Knowledge Exchange Network, which everyone can access uh, at www.ken.cafc.org. That's ken.cafc.org. Um, and uh, Deb and Abby, I'm assuming we'll be able to get the uh, PowerPoint slides, the PDF of the PowerPoint slides? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, so we'll post the video, the audio video and the, and the PowerPoint slides up on, on the CAN. It usually takes a few days to, before that's up. But, uh, the second question was, um, and I'm sure this is a question that's on, considering the audience, uh, that's on a, a lot of people's minds. I think it was referring back to around slide 15 uh, when you had your list of uh, priorities and benchmarks. He says, uh, pediatrics does not seem to fit with any of the priorities or benchmarks. How do you make sure one area does not get left behind? Yeah. So that's a, that's a, very, good, um, a very good question. And what we're just trying to ensure that we are doing is balancing and, and monitoring um, both our service levels and the demand um, supply. So if we were to see that there are um, unmet needs, like we are investing, I think it's about um, three to five million dollars in additional maternity beds. We actually also are taking forward a request for some additional NICU beds. So we do continue, the, our clinical leaders do continue to monitor that on a, on a regular basis. And at, if they start to see where there are um, increasing um, access issues, or changes in sort of population growth demographics, then they do bring those forward and we, and we will make adjustments. So it's, it's certainly our intention to ensure that we continue to balance um, all, the different all the different sectors. And I would add to that that PEDS won't be a separate line in this, but they are definitely included in each of the initiatives. So for instance, the obesity, diabetes, and chronic disease management, there are um, PEDS people, representatives from the peace groups involved in that work, and so they would definitely be getting a piece of that funding as well as um, any increase in surgeries 
or emergency wait time. So they're definitely a piece of each of these. And in fact, with the Self Health Campus project, they're actually the first implementation in the Self Health Campus is is the is the maternal services is actually our first implementation there at Self Health Campus. Uh, we just had another question, uh, um, actually, from Alan, and Alan, feel free to, to, to pipe in if, uh, if I don't capture it all, but he's asked, given, given that three-quarters of the costs are driven by physician practice, how has physician leadership been engaged and involved in leading these system changes? And also, given 75% of, of costs are labor, how have unions been engaged to help support this needed change? So those are sort of two separate questions. Okay. No, both very, actually, very good questions, and actually, I had written down some notes to talk about the the clinical. So we, we are in the process of developing clinical networks. There are about five that are currently in place. Actually, um, one of the new ones that's just going to be started is a maternal clinical network. Um, and as well, we do have a physician leadership model, um, which is a dyad model. So for every one of our major prog programs, there is both a um, administrative lead as well as a clinical lead. So, I d you know, can we always do a better job of involving physicians? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't by any stretch of the imagination say that we've got it all covered, but it is definitely one within the senior executive team within Alberta Health Services. I think there's eight senior leaders. Three of them are physicians, um, including, as I said, our current acting CEO is Dr. Chris Eagle, who's uh, an anesthesiologist. So I do think that um, I would say that based on one of the things that I have observed since I've come to Alberta is that there is a real focus on trying to ensure that physician leadership um, and physician um, input is is reflected and is involved in decision making. But what I say, we, you know, there's still room to, to move in that area, absolutely. Um, but I think we're actually, we do do a pretty good job of trying to ensure that we get the right people to the table. In terms of the unions, um, that's been a, a very difficult um, piece in terms of trying to bring all of those different unions together. Um, as you know, that that does then mean that some unions won and some unions lost in terms of um, the support services area. But uh, in terms of some of our clinical, like with the nurses, the United Nurses of Alberta, um, that is one, one union, so they have been involved as well. Um, as an example, in the last contract agreement, there was a 2% uh, lift that was given to the nurses on the understanding that that would be funded from an increase in productivity. So there has been some good collaboration between the union and um, management in some of those areas, as well as there's a number of uh, different workforce planning initiatives that are underway that have uh, leadership and representation from the unions as well. All right, thanks. Uh, and, and that's all the questions we have for now, and there have been a, few, a number of people have joined since we started the webinar, so I just want to remind everyone, uh, for those of you who have just joined, there is a question box in your control panel. It should be on the right-hand side of your screen. And as we go along, there, there will be another opportunity to, uh, for the, our presenters to answer more questions later on, so feel free as we go along to type in any questions that come to mind. So uh, back over to you, Deb and Abby. Okay, so moving forward, we have a stronger fo uh, focus in data categorization and spend analysis. So um, we have implemented a system called P2P, which stands for Procure to Pay. And that is a system where, where we um, part, in part um, requisition orders electronically, and it routes for approval electronically. So in some programs, they're spread out all across the province. And so that saves both time and money. And the other piece of it is invoice approval. So we get invoices and we electronically scan them into the system and then they're routed for approval anywhere in the province. And along with that system is a new management reporting tool that helps us across the province. So it has helped to standardize the reports that we get because with the um, joining of 13 entities, we all had separate reporting systems. We all had um, different types of reports that were available to our executive, as well as different levels of detail that we could get at. So this new management reporting tool has standardized that in that everybody has access to the same information to the same amount of detail. We're also looking to recruit skilled and qualified staff. 
um, in part to help with the investments that that we're making over the next few years, but also just to fill current vacancies that we have within our system. Uh, more focus on contract management, as well as standardization and rationalization, so looking at a process and service level review across the province. More provincial co collaboration, and also executive support and direction as we move forward. So, like we said, we consolidate 13 entities, and so over the next year we're looking to consolidate the GLs for each of those entities. We're still operating our legacy GLs as well as a provincial GL, and um, this will help. We have a new uh, HRMS system that's coming in place that will also help us with consolidating those GLs. The HRMS tool is a movement of all 90,000 staff into one payroll system, and we're expected to be complete in about a year. And also looking at another phase for both our management reporting and our procure to pay tool. So uh, our P2P initiative launched the middle of February, so it's, it's very new to us in the organization, and we're still growing and learning every day with that system. It's a collaborative three-year project between uh, contracting, procurement, and supply management, which we call CPSM, finance, and information technology, and also management within the organization. This project delivers a single province-wide finance and supply chain application that eliminates dependencies on disparate regional-based systems. And within year one, which we're just coming, we're just at the beginning of, the project objective is for implementation of this single province-wide shared technology platform with supporting standardized processes. So some of the benefits that we've seen of our procure-to-pay system is a single source of data and the ability to track inventory and costs across the organization the elimination of error-prone paper processes, and improved response turnaround times, a potential for streamlined no-touch requisitioning process through um, iProcurement, reduced manual intervention and data entry leading to greater efficiency, pr productivity, and accuracy, and alignment to industry-leading practices through the use of proven enterprise resource planning applications. So just an example would be um, some of our programs that are spread across the province. Sometimes just to get a simple sign-off on a travel expense could take weeks by the time it moves from office to office and then finally comes to accounts payable where it's actually processed and paid, where now within the system it could happen in a much more shorter time frame with everybody just going on electronically approving. And then the Management Reporting Initiative, which is our tool that provides reports to all levels of the organization, um, was also launched in the middle of February to coincide with our procure-to-pay system. It delivers a new consolidated management reporting solution to address critical management reporting requirements. So in, within this tool, um, management has access to 10 different financial reports, which just takes the information and just turns it a little bit differently. It aims to integrate a solution that supports the transfer of data feeds from legacy sources into a single source where gaps in data may be experienced. And the initial release concentrated on the implementation of management reporting of the general ledger and budget information for frontline and operational managers. Some of the benefits that we've seen of this tool is that we have a provincial view of a summary of the budget and actual data from the general ledger to frontline managers, and that it's a standardized reporting system. So everybody within the province, like I said before, has access to the same information. Um, and it's leveraging proven Oracle tools that will be deployed over, we have 7,000 frontline managers, finance, and CPSM staff across Alberta. So some of the lessons learned, so if we just take a step back and look at the last few years, some of the lessons that we've learned through trials and tribulations have been that we've had a significant turnover in leadership, which has resulted in uh, foregone momentum. 
We've had a shortfall in funding required, requiring us to cut staff before the implementing of the right org structure and provincial system. So in year one, we had a freeze on for both filling current vacancies as well as bringing in additional staff until we could figure out what was what should our org structure be. And we're still working through some of that to fine tune our structure within the province. And we've had high attrition combined with layoffs and, like I said, a vacancy freeze, which made it difficult to get the right people in the right places. Some of the successes that we've had is greater provincial collaboration, both operational and financial efficiencies, the ability to now attract strong staff, that people are quite interested in being a part of Alberta Health Services, recognition of internal inequities and a commitment to achieve a better balance, and mechanisms for decisions and greater transparency in those decisions that are made. Some of the lessons that we've learned the hard way is when the announcement was made and Alberta Health Services came to be, there really wasn't much of a merger strategy. And so that made it hard because we spent most of the first year coming up with what should our plan be and how are we going to operate. Um, leadership needs to stay in place. Uh, another lesson learned the hard way was not to rush into cost savings in the first year of the merger, which we did. Uh, not to underestimate the cultural differences, but to respect them. And, and we had an unusual way of a merger where we had no parents. So we had these 13 entities that came together, but one wasn't chosen as this is the way that the direction that we're going to go. And so uh, you literally have to start everything from the beginning, but people are very stuck in their ways of doing things and the culture that they had in their previous organization. And we still see that today in a lot of areas. Uh, we would have provided some strong change management tools and um, just focused on some of the small incremental change. I think people were looking, had these expectations that we'd make these big changes right away. And it's really hard to do when you're an organization our size, not just in terms of people, but spread out over the geographies that we are. So I guess we'd just like to open it up for questions, or Doug, if you've received any more questions. I haven't actually received any other questions, but uh, Alan uh, or, or Donna uh, Sherman, uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and, and join in if there's any, any comments following the presentation so far. And everyone in the audience, uh, feel free to uh, type in any questions if, if there are any more questions out there. I can add, and while, you know, while people are doing that, I can add a few more comments, I guess, so just what I've seen since I came um, to Alberta Health, Health Services. So in terms of um, <clears throat> that merger, so for those of you that may, may not know, there were two very, very big participants, right, the Calgary Health Region and the former Capital Health, which was Edmonton. So, so th that was basically the big issue was, you know, do we use um, what either of those former entities had in place or do we build build from scratch. And in different areas of the organization, we have done a little bit of both. But primarily, I think, um, mostly we've just tried to build um, build our own. So uh, you know, in terms of the finance system, we went with Oracle, which both, both systems had used, but had used them in different ways. The former, most of the former smaller entities had been on Meditech. So the decision was to go with Oracle versus, versus Meditech. In terms of payroll, um, we chose PeopleSoft Payroll, which is, of course, an Oracle partner as well, and that had been the system that Calgary had been on. Um, Edmonton had been on a uh, homegrown system uh, called Vax, which had worked very, very well for them, but technology was um, older and was more of a issue. So um, one of the, that was partly that drove the decision to go with something um, sort of proven in terms in terms of Oracle. So those were some of some of the things. I think one of the other big things is that, um, as Abby said, with the rush into cost savings, one of the first things that occurred was there were significant um, cost uh, reductions in both finance and human resources. And I think in retrospect, we would all say that we think that that was probably not um, the best course of action. Um, because what resulted then is that they lost both the staff that um, 
was downsized, as you might say, but also you then found a lot of people that basically were left carrying um, incredible workloads um, in a environment that was very unstable. So in finance, we have actually had close to 50% turnover, I think, over the last three years. So that would be one huge learning, is that probably in those core areas, you need to actually beef up staff as you're trying to do some of this work, um, at least in the early, early years, till you get stable, and then you move on. Because from our clinical and operations folks, one of the things that they would say that has been hampering their ability to move forward with some of their initiatives is the support or the level of support um, that they're receiving from both human resources and finance. So both of those areas are working really, really hard to try and put the fundamentals in place to be able to support the organization and be able to support um, their needs. I would have to say that they have been very patient and very supportive and have identified that they understand that those have to be some of the highest priorities for the organization is to get those two sort of building blocks in place. But, you know, we're almost three years into the merger. Um, so, you know, I myself in finance, um, and I know my colleagues in human resources as well, you know, we do understand that we need to get those fundamentals in place as quickly as possible so that the clinical folks can move forward with what they need to do um, in terms of both service delivery um, as well as trying to generate um, some of the cost savings, et cetera, that they've been tasked with. Deborah, I've got a question for you, and I believe it was one of the slides that, that you addressed. It's going back a wee bit. It's Elaine. Um, and it was around engaging the unions. I think it was actually a discussion that uh, generated in, in part to Alan's question. So around that, the union engagement, you had mentioned that um, you have been able to negotiate a 2% increase, if I heard that correctly, for, this is for the, for your, for that nurses, for your nurses union, based on productivity. Right. So I'm just, I'm just curious if you could expand a little bit on, on exactly sort of how that has rolled out and, and where is the, um, the accountability um, and, and how in fact is, is that productivity demonstrated? Yeah. And, and, that's good, Elaine. I can take a crack at that. And it's very new, so it's just being put in place this year. But some of the ideas are, and some of the, what's happening is that, as I said, we do have a senior vice president that's in charge of just um, clinical uh, and professional leaders, so um, basically in charge of working with our different health professionals. And some of the things that we're looking at are um, one of the initiatives that we have underway is to ensure that we are maximizing full-time workers. So there is a real concentrated agreement between um, both the union and the organization that we will do our best to maximize, maximize full-time jobs. So mm -hmm. we're trying to reduce the number of part-time jobs that we have and create full-time jobs. So that's been one area of focus and um, collaboration between both the union and, uh, and employers as well as you know looking at scope of practice and ensuring that we've got the right people doing the right tasks. Um, so there's been lots of focus on that as well. Um, scheduling, uh, looking at schedule changes, um, looking at our overtime. Um, started a joint uh, AHS and UNA workforce committee. So that, those are some of, some of the ideas and some of what um, has been happening. It is very early days though. That is just that worker is just starting. That increase took effect April 1 of 2011. So um, we'll, we will be monitoring that to see how it goes, but that's sort of the idea uh, behind it, you know, a commitment to hire, um, I think, at least 70% of all new grads out of all of our different uh, uh, teaching institutions. So those are some of the ideas, um, but there's a very uh, concerted effort um, at looking at uh, some of those workforce um, planning strategies because we do know that at our population growth and at our current staffing mixes, we believe that we would need to add more staff than what we think we could actually be able to find over the course of the next five to ten years. So um, we're definitely looking at a lot of different initiatives. Debbie, it's Alan. I'm interested in the the almost the debate about 
whether you disinvest first and then reinvest later or you need to spend money to make money or make savings, so to speak. And there's always the, and understandably, from the patient care side, you want to see all non-patient care things done as much as possible before you actually have to go and impact the patient care side of the equation. But yet when you went to the administration and the back office functions first, you whittled it down so it made those teams that had to make a lot of these things and support a lot of these things happening difficult to do because the staff weren't there. How do you grapple with where to go first to uh, enable success here? Yeah, that's a very good question, um, Alan. And I think it's interesting, you know, in retrospect, if there had been a plan in place, when the merger started, um, and we could have addressed some of the, you know, the finance and HR systems early on in the process. I think that by now we would be in a place where we could have started to see more of those efficiencies in some of those areas. So agreed, because there, there, there will be efficiencies in those areas. Like bringing together those former systems and getting us all onto one platform, we will see significant savings. But, but we didn't. We shouldn't have done what we did, which was cutting those to start. Because as I said, you know, we could have maybe survived with just the cut that happened, but then the additional attrition that happened where people got worried and people saw that, you know, some of their colleagues were leaving, et cetera, and then, you know, the additional sort of 25 plus percent attrition that we got um, was also then a compounding factor. Um, and in terms of, you know, one of the things that I think we've got a lot of potential here to do, which um, now that we're getting some of these base systems in place, um, is things like um, standardization of supplies. Like we have not done any of that in a significant way yet because we didn't have any data to support that. I also think that we will, once we're able to get um, spend and procurement analytics on things like travel, uh, I think that there are significant potential savings for us as an organization. But currently, we can't gather any of that information. Um, so sort of in the course of the next year, I think we're going to start to see some real potential of some areas where we can get some very quick and hard savings that will not affect patient care. Um, on the patient care side, really what our, our focus is going to be is we're not looking to reduce services, but looking to take advantage of learnings in different areas. So as an example, in the southern part of the province, down in the Lethbridge Medicine Hat area, they've been very success successful with um, keeping people in their homes, with good home care support, the whole assisted living, their utilization of both level four beds as well as acute care beds on a per capita basis is lower. So they seem to have done some really good things in terms of being able to um, make more inroads in some of that um, primary care area. So those are some of what we're trying to look at. We have real inequities in terms of hospital beds per adjusted population, et cetera, that those are the areas that we're looking at. So, And we're not necessarily dri trying to drive to lowest utilization, but to what we would see as to be the most appropriate utilization. So in some cases, um, you know, we know that that won't be the lowest. Like, you know, we know that probably the lowest is an area that's underserved. So we need to help bring them up to to a more appropriate level. But just trying to, one of the real goals of Alberta Health Services have been to try and really be able to demonstrate that your access to quality care should not be impacted by where you lived. So, and, and, I, and I do believe that that is really one of the big strengths that comes out of this model um, when we get there. Alan, I'm just wondering, did, did you want to sort of provide a couple of comments um, at this point, so just targeting the, the, the pediatric financial network and, and uh, what we can draw from today perhaps moving forward? Well, absolutely. And I still think there's lots for each of us to learn from one another, and Alberta's uh, proceeding down a road, and we can definitely watch and, and support them too. I am interested, though, in, in how pediatrics fares in this environment because of the uh, geriatric population obviously putting the greatest pressure on all of us. Mm -hmm. But as we continue with this, I'm interested in folks contributing ideas on areas in pediatric care around their own best practices and what we could potentially do for future webinars as well. 
and I'll throw a topic out there that our, our committee discussed. At the IWK here, we've introduced uh, LPNs and CTAs into our NICU, um, and that was no small undertaking, as, as you can well imagine, but we did uh, pre- and post-evaluation surveys and looked at uh, all the evidence of best practice, full scope of practice, and everything, and it was, it was a good year plus, and job satisfaction and safety has been equal, if not higher, uh, post that than before. So be happy to share that. I'm wondering if there's other topics out there that folks think we should be looking at that continue to try and share with where we all are in our efforts to uh, maintain our services in an efficient and effective way. And we don't have to answer that necessarily today, but they can type it on uh, the thing to Doug here or send it in to us on the committee, and uh, we can try to get another webinar set up here, as Elaine said, on a quarterly basis. Mm -hmm. And the um, Alan's email, actually, as well as mine, um, are listed there at the bottom of this webinar invitation, so if folks wanted to... Uh, you know, to sort of throw us a, um, an email with some ideas. Um, also, if anyone wanted to, to actually be a presenter on one of our webinars, we would be delighted to hear from you as well. Really help us capture sort of what are some of the key areas that we really need to address uh, as, as far as sharing best practices and, and just learning from each other. And I do want to say on behalf of certainly other areas in the country, a huge thanks to Debbie and Abby and, and others from Alberta for sharing your experience and, and frankly being quite candid with uh, some things that have obviously gone well, but also some struggles you've had. I think even if we can avoid pitfalls, that's a step in the right direction for the rest of us as well. So that's uh, your, your candid uh, presentation was very much appreciated. Thank you so much, Ellen. And I think your point is very well taken um, in terms of ensuring that, you know, the children and pediatrics don't get lost as, as the focus is, you know, and as you heard, our focus um, is, our first early focus is to try and address some of those needs for seniors. But there, by doing that, we believe strongly that that will then open up um, capacity to the rest of the system. Um, so childhood obesity is definitely one of our big factors. Childhood immunization, our child, children's immunization rates are not where they need to be, so that big focus for us there as well. Um, and, and as you heard us say around children's mental health. So in lots of ways, the trying to address the issue around the seniors is to try and then open up the capacity and the, and the resources to the rest of the system so that we can ensure um, that we do make sure that we meet the needs of the rest of those populations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And pediatrics is where upstream health care maintenance and investment is going to be for a sustainable system in the long run. So successful strategies in our patient population will be key for the next decades and the next generations. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think um, we're sort of checking the screens at, at this point, and I don't think there are any more questions. I'll, I'll speak very, very slowly as we, as we close out if anyone does want to type in a final question. But um, I, too, want to recognize um, the leadership um, that Alan Horsborough is actually providing to this work and really express our appreciation to you, Alan. Um, I want to thank obviously um, our speakers, um, as Alan did, and I really want to, uh, to thank Doug Maynard, CAFC's Associate Director, as always, for really being the leader behind um, the technology and, and uh, our, um, our opportunity, in fact, to come together with so many people across the country uh, using this media. We will be um, back in touch with, uh, with everyone who has registered for today's webinar um, to, um, uh, to sort of announce the next, uh, the next webinar date and time and, and focus. Again, uh, if you wanted to contribute to that development process, please just send us a quick email and, uh, and help us sort of address what really is key to, to you and your organization. And I think on that note, if there are no other questions, um, I would thank everyone for attending and really look forward to 
our next webinar together, which will come over the next couple of months. So thank you to all.